Hello, this is the 25th hour. I'm John Gallardo. And I'm Chelsea Robert. We're back with a new set of stories from across Ottawa produced by Carleton Video Journalists. We're covering everything from strong businesswomen to running with a weak heart. And running for political office. But we can't forget about those climate crusaders. We have it all covered, so get ready. It's time for the 25th hour. When we think of elections, we usually think of the four main parties. But what about those parties on the fringe, the ones that have no shot of winning? We found out how another red wave is trying to survive. At the start of every debate, almost like clockwork, a Communist Party protester asking one question. I'd like to know where the Communist Party candidate is, Stuart Ryan, who has worked 33 years at Carleton University, and he should be allowed to speak. He was, he was confirmed before the People's Party candidate, okay? So I want to know why he is not allowed to speak. Um, they like to ignore us. Stuart Ryan was the Communist Party candidate for Ottawa Centre. He faced an uphill battle after being excluded from debates where crowds couldn't hear his message and faced off against political giants. But Ryan remained hopeful. So we got to push for that people's agenda, working for issues that support working people. So we'll do that during the election, we'll do it after the election. It's not the first time Ginger Neuvendorf had heard the promises of the Communist Party, having fled Communist Germany over three decades ago. I don't even want to talk about this, if you don't mind. We had to That's leave okay. everything behind and it was, was not easy. However, Vincent Kama, the party's candidate for Ottawa West Nepean, sees it differently. Communism means flipping the script and making sure that workers are put in the driver's seat. Despite hope for the party, Kama knew what he was up against during this election season. The election itself was a way to just spread that message. We don't actually think we're going to elect. We're going to get elected. <laughs> you know, we don't. We're not under any uh, any illusions. Both Ryan and Kama say it's important to seize the opportunity and to spread the communist ideology. Uh, this is the one time where people pay attention to politics. So we want to get our word out. We're always have been advocating for a people's coalition of putting forward issues important to the working class and the people, and so we're, that's still the philosophy. We're not gonna, we're not gonna hide uh, when, when, the, when, the, uh, when the elections get called, uh, because even though like, there are bourgeois elections and they're, they're likely not going to change very much in this country, but it's just another opportunity for us to get out there, uh, to, to put our little uh, uh, our pamphlet okay, into people's hands and say, this is what we're talking about, this is what we're about. Uh, uh, if you if you like it, you know, vote for it. The Communist Party isn't only focused on economic reform. They say they have a full platform that tackles issues such as social housing, gender equality, and job security. We plan to build like a whole bunch of stuff, like a, a one million units of social housing, to actually address the housing crisis in this country. So that'd be one thing. You'd have less people on the streets. You'd have more support. Uh, for uh, uh, for drug addicts, for uh, uh, for uh, people with disabilities, for 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 all these things, abortion, uh, 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 maternal care, you know what have you? Like uh, this is a, uh, we would make that uh, a non-negotiable. Like that, that that would be the thing. Uh, we would uh, 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 guarantee everybody jobs. Okay, uh, uh, by taking over industry, the the, the money is is there. <laughs> it's just right now it's invested in, in garbage uh, and weapons of war and, uh, and not taxing uh, the rich. It's in an offshore bank account. As for the concerns about what is happening in communist countries like Venezuela, Stuart Ryan says that people are not getting the whole story. Starving? They're not starving. There are people with medical equipment and stuff. There are shortages of food. Because they were in part food, they didn't develop their own agricultural. There are people in the western part of the country who are trying to develop food to service uh, service the people, but uh, there are guerrillas coming across the border, Venezuela, who are attacking these people. Kama says that the most valuable thing for the party at this time is increasing the number of Canadians who believe in communism. I don't care about votes. 
Yeah, I don't care about votes. Votes is a very symbolic thing right now. Like what we want is to to recruit, to 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 get more people, to uh, to help us do this work. Could you help? Because <laughs> we need it. Like uh, so, that would be the victory. It would be, it would be getting more people uh, people involved. We're gonna be out here right after the election, uh, working. Uh, wherever wherever we are in, in the student movement and in, uh, in unions and in, uh, in everything in the program we say what we mean we're gonna do that like that's what we want we've already decided we've already had plenty of discussions and if you want to discuss with us just join the party we're talking about issues uh, that, that actually matter in people's lives we have a comprehensive flow program that we have to talk about like uh, like uh, we're not out here to uh, uh, to antagonize anybody except for the rich so in the end neither candidates we spoke to won their election Stuart Ryan ended up with 111 votes, while Vincent Kama ended up with 104. Both of them losing to their political opponents in the Liberal Party. Now, both candidates say that they're going to spend some time relaxing post-election, and will continue to spread the message of communism for their next four years. In June, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls released its final report, but for a sister of one of the victims, a report is not enough. And this is my sister Gina. She's the oldest, Patty, and then myself. I was about almost three years old, I believe. She would have been four and she would have been five. Colleen Cardinal is an indigenous woman from Saddle Lake Cree Nation in Alberta. She lost her sister 29 years ago. She was murdered in 1990 at Beaver Hills House Park in downtown Edmonton. My biological father called me and said, uh, you know that woman they found in the park? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, that's your sister. And I, I like, my whole world just like, just flipped upside down. Cause like I'd never ever experienced anybody dying before. I'd never been to a funeral before. It was like a dream. Like I was walking like in a murky dream for the next couple days, maybe even months. I just felt like I was in a bubble and I couldn't really, uh, nothing made sense. So it was hard. She looks for photos of her sister in a pink box that she keeps in her dining room. Yeah, I don't have very many photos of her. Yet she finds only few that bring her back to the time she had with her sisters. Cardinal and her two sisters were adopted together during the 60s scoop a policy that resulted in more than 20,000 indigenous children being forcibly taken from their homes and placed into homes with non-indigenous families. One of the one of the things that we have in common as, as 60 Scoop survivors is not only have we been through the child welfare system, um, a lot of us have had missing and murdered indigenous relatives, sisters and brothers, mothers, um, aunties, and it's just part of the colonial violence that we, we've experienced in Canada. She ran away with her sisters from their abusive home. They wanted to be free and far away from their abusive father who sexually and physically assaulted them. Brother, adopted mother, and I cut my adoptive father out. I was so terrified at one time in my life that I'd be killed too, so I used to carry a knife with me. But I know women who carry knives to this day. In Canada, statistics show that Indigenous women and girls are much more likely to experience violence than non-Indigenous women. The RCMP released a report in 2014 saying 164 indigenous women were missing and 1,017 were murdered between 1980 and 2012. The same report says 225 of these cases are still unsolved. Families and friends of the victims report these cases to the authorities, but they see these cases neglected and forgotten. I find my and just died not knowing what happened to her daughter. Not too long ago. She's been missing for over 10 years. For years, Colleen and many other Indigenous women, families and friends have come to mourn their loved ones every October 4th at the Parliament Hill. I'm scared. I'm scared to be in the dark alone. As they come to mourn, they share heartbreaking stories of their loved ones going missing or being murdered. One of the organizers, Bridget Tolley, has been part of the vigil for 15 years. 
okay. And it'll never be okay till we get to the truth. We've been asking for the truth. You know, and I've been saying it over and over. Reopen closed cases. The truth is in there, the way they investigated our cases. You want to see the truth? It's there. Let's reopen those cases and see the real truth. Despite the many unsolved cases, Colleen still has hope for a better future. I'm optimistic. I have hope that people can change. I have hope that, you know, the, the youth, like I said, are going to lead the way. They're going to change that dialogue. They're going to unlearn that uh, violence that is already perpetuating the problem. In a perfect world, in a perfect Canada, what I would like to see is I would like to see Canada honour their treaties and how we share the resources and the profits from the resources and honour those treaties, those agreements that we signed with them to share the land and the profits and, and for us to be equal, not us below them. Running is an activity with many health benefits, but two deaths during popular race weekends in Ottawa have shaken the running community. Are these events safe? Can another tragedy be prevented? Running the Risks investigates. 59-year-old David Daze finished his 30th marathon this year. As my own kids came along, I was kind of looking for something that I could do uh, whenever, as in on the spur of the moment, you know, when the kids are asleep or whatnot, that's when I can sneak out the door. And once I started running, I really, really enjoyed it. But every year, a few don't complete their race safely. 26-year-old Philip Everson died at the Army Run in Ottawa this September, going into cardiac arrest after crossing the half marathon line. In May, a 35-year-old man died during Ottawa Race Weekend, also after going into cardiac arrest. Each one is a tragedy that for many runners overshadows the joys of going the distance. But does it have to happen? Marc-Antoine Deschamps has first-hand experience responding to running-related injuries. Sometimes you will get uh, what's called a cardiac arrhythmia, so it's when uh, the electricity in the heart doesn't follow the regular part of it and becomes erratic. Uh, at that point, a person will uh, pass out, uh, they might have a seizure, and now they'll become limp. What's important for them is some cardiac arrests are very sudden. There will not be any uh, precursor signs. The person will simply collapse. Uh, however, it's important for uh, the, the, the athletes that are running these types of events to uh, be aware of their own body, to realize that they feel something that they never felt before, that is not similar to what they felt during uh, their training. It's important at that point that they seek medical care right away. Around 38,000 runners participate in Ottawa Race Weekend. Executive Director Ian Fraser explains the risk. As soon as you start to scale numbers, uh, the chances of, of things happening in your, in your event go up uh, by an equivalent magnitude, almost exponentially. So we know um, that with that many people doing our event, we're going to have we're going to have things happen whether we like it or not. A lot depends on the heat and how, um, what the temperature is. So we've experienced uh, three of the last four years uh, abnormally high temperatures on race day, um, which has resulted in us having to tweak the start times for some of the events on Sunday so that we uh, remain in the cooler part of the day. Those sorts of incidents uh, scale upwards when it gets warmer. So you get um, dehydration issues, you get heat stroke issues. Daze says all runners, both newcomers and veterans, should know and take some simple safety measures. Whether it's a short run around the block or if I'm running a marathon, I always make sure my road ID is attached to my shoe. And my road ID essentially um, uh, identifies me and it also identifies my emergency contacts so my wife and kids names and phone numbers are on it as well so if I ever run into any difficulty and someone needs to identify me this is how they do it with the road ID 
I'm 59 years old and I've already done 30 marathons. So uh, I'm pretty healthy and um, uh, I just make sure I'm well trained going into a race. And uh, typically if you're going into a marathon, you're training uh, over a uh, you know, 12 to 16 week period. And even before that, you know, it's rare someone just decides to run a marathon. Usually they start at a lower distance and then they work their way up. So they already have a certain level of fitness before they start marathon training, uh, which is what I recommend for people is, um, you know, make sure you, you have a certain level of fitness before you start marathon training. So if a problem is going to occur, oftentimes it occurs in training. A couple of years ago, uh, I was training for the Philadelphia Marathon but I um, uh, came up with some knee problems and whatnot, and I was about a month out from the marathon, and I decided to pull the plug on it because I knew, uh, you know, I was running through an injury, which is never good. What we do is supposed to be good for people. It's supposed to be fun. And by and large, it always is. Um, and we like to think that far and away on average, we do more good for the health of our community than we do harm. And the reality around some of the cardiac incidents that happen is that oftentimes um, these participants, these people have, have an underlying cardiac condition that they, that they don't know that they have and they don't really know that they have it until they hit a crisis situation in an event like this. Would that have happened to them at some point in their life? Maybe, I don't know. There's a possi strong possibility it would have. But if you think of all the people that have, have um, change their lifestyle through running, change their lifestyle through um, getting involved in endurance sport, the positives far outweigh the negatives. Runners like Daze understand that every time they line up for a race, they may be running a risk. The environment is changing, but not for the better. How are people making a difference? The 25th hour takes a look. The 2019 federal election was the first in Canada to have a majority of voters from the millennial generation. One of the main issues dominating this election was each of the parties and their plans on climate change. We took a look at three individuals who are each doing their own part at fighting climate change. News Grocery is Ottawa's first zero waste grocery store in downtown Ottawa bringing sustainability and convenience to its community. Olivia Turner is a neuroscience and mental health student at Carleton University who is doing her part to live sustainably. I, mean, I started this um, probably six months ago now um, where I made a, a conscious effort to anything that I can buy without plastic packaging, I'm going to buy without plastic packaging and make that effort even if it takes me to a different store than my regular grocery store, um, you know, all the better. It wasn't long before Olivia's lifestyle change began to influence her friends. Uh, they're, they're buying jars themselves and, and um, beeswax wrap is an alternative to plastic wrap and um, reusable Tupperware and reusable bags instead of plastic and um, even those small change, those changes in using a coffee tumbler instead of a takeout um, cup with plastic that's just going to be thrown away, those small changes are where it starts. We followed Green Party candidate Les Schramm as he went canvassing around Ottawa South. What motivates you to run and go out canvassing every day? I have three children and six grandchildren. And I look at climate, the climate, I look at the uh, degradation of the oceans, and I look at the degradation of um, the forests in Brazil and so on, and I say, you have to step up to the plate so they can have a future. You know, if, if we don't do something with climate change, guess what? By the time the worst of it hits, I'll be gone. But my grandchildren won't be. My children won't be. So I have to do something to make their world better. It's that simple. Shram sees the importance of millennial voters. So in 2015, uh, young people came out in larger numbers than they had for 
for generations. Mm -hmm. um, they will be coming out, I believe, in even larger numbers this time, and it will change things because millennials tend to be uh, more aligned with the NDP or, or, or the Green Party than they are with the Liberals or the, um, or the uh, Conservatives. In order for SRAM to achieve his sustainable future, he goes directly to the source. So, um, when you get to talk to people, it makes a huge difference. According to Elections Canada, in the 2019 federal election, more than 100,000 people voted on campus between October 5th and October 9th. A recent Yale University study found that millennials are more willing to contact government officials about climate change, donate money to organizations willing to fight climate change, and volunteer time to organizations willing to fight climate change than any other generation. Student Energy, a Canada-wide student organization, seeks to address the need for student engagement to lead sustainable energy policy. Uh, I, like everyone at Student Energy, believe that young people, millennials, need to be at the forefront of this movement. As young people, we're used to change. We grew up during a recession. We have been at the period with the most change in technology, and we bring a lot of those perspectives to the table. And at the end of the day, climate change is something that is going to affect us. It is our reality for the rest of our lives, which is why we need to be at the decision-making table and why our, our perspectives need to be taken into account. So whether it's marching on the streets or voting at the polls, we as young people know that climate change is our issue and we need to own it. The 2019 federal election is now behind us. And with over a million votes, the Green Party made waves in the House of Commons, gaining two seats for a grand total of three, which is the most it's had in Canadian history. For young people like Olivia, this election's focus on climate change was a win because it drove conversation on what a sustainable future looks like in Canada. We're the future and it's impacting us more than it's impacting the older generations. So if we continue on this path, we're not going to have the same earth that we live on now, unfortunately, and our, our kids will, our kids will be impacted, our grandkids will be impacted. So I think we're seeing the more imminent damage that it could cause being in this environmental crisis that we're in right now. The fact that youth are leading the way is very important and speaks volumes to the change that needs to happen in, in politics. In 2015, 57% of young people turned out to vote. But who voted this time and how do they feel about the results? The 25th Hours field team got some answers. Here on Carleton campus is where many students voted in the last election. With climate change a top priority, We've come here to see how they want the new government to act on the issue. I think educating students what they can do to vote with their dollars is like a huge thing. Um, supporting B Corp corporations um, is huge. Well, a lot of people feel that they need to do something crazy and outlandish. I feel just have a positive start right away, especially with the U.S. going backwards in the international like you know commitments. Canada going sternly ahead with you know like. Um, introducing more uh, electric cars. That's like a strong policy, you know. I think that it's going to be really important for the government to, instead of, tack uh, instead of tackling like just single-use plastics, they need to actually start speaking to corporations about all of the um, plastics and fumes and stuff that they're releasing into the environment because I think that those definitely have way more of an impact than just me using a straw, which I still don't do that, but I just think that it have much more of an impact on the environment. And I'm also like totally for the carbon tax. I don't really think it's that big of an issue because if I'm going to be putting my money into our society, I think it's worth it. Um, I think the Canadian government, particularly the Liberals, um, decided that they were going to impose a carbon tax. They're going to put a price on pollution. And I think that price on pollution is just hurting the people in rural Canada. And I see it because I'm, I've spent time in rural Canada and I think that is not what the government should be doing right now. I think innovating is what the Canadian government ought to be doing. Giving Canadians tax breaks for putting green technology in their homes um, and just concrete steps toward making um, innovation, green innovation and incentivizing green innovation. Building a sustainable future has its challenges. That's why these climate crusaders are making their lifestyles more eco-friendly.
The sun rises on a new day in Ottawa. Cheyenne and Luke begin to open up shop. What once was an online store has now grown into a business, selling curated vintage clothes in their new store on Bank Street. When I was younger, my mom would always take me. Like She always had like the mindset, why buy something new for $100 when you can get something that's used in great condition for like half the price or less. So I, I like, as far as I can remember, I've always just been a regular at Value Village and stores like that. It's funny because I come from like the opposite yeah. end of that where I was always kind of, like I always thought it was just like tacky stuff there. Like I always thought it was just like a, not a clean environment. But then it was like when I had friends start showing me like, hey, I found this at the thrifts and it would be like a sweet like starter jacket from the 90s or just like a crazy band tee. That's when I realized like you can actually find gems at the thrifts. So that's when I started going, started to try to pull more myself and it just became like a fun thing of just like digging through. Obviously you're digging through a lot that's like, it's not the kind of stuff you're looking for, but it's that feeling of finding that one gem that makes that whole trip to the thrift worth it. You can pay the same amount for something that's much better quality than going to one of the, like I don't want to name any stores, but going to one of those fast fashion stores and getting a t-shirt for like $10, but you know it's not going to last and you know nobody's going to want it when you're done wearing it. But with like a lot of the things that you can find in the thrifts, it's things that have a story behind it. And you know like it's going to keep going for a longer time. This is a Levi's jacket from the 80s. It was made in Yugoslavia. So that obviously that country doesn't exist anymore. So you can see how vintage is helping carry on clothing from like, what was that, 40 years ago now? Yeah, environmentally, that was like a big part of it. Because it's like, that's one of the biggest environmental problems now that we've everyone has realized like it came as a big thing that like clothing production is a huge problem on the environment so it's like the best thing you can do is just buy a clothing that's already been produced because it's already been yeah. made you don't have to worry about buying one that's a newly produced one and the quality of older stuff is way better too so that's yeah the world is changing youth are trying to find a way to change with it with pressure building to find climate solutions, people across the globe are acknowledging that proper action needs to be taken in order to prevent further environmental distress. Mobilizing their peers and inciting changes in their everyday lives are how these students are taking up arms against climate change. Yeah, there's like a big movement around uh, climate activism right now with like Greta Thunberg and like the Fridays for Future, which is like high school students that miss school every Friday to protest. Um, so I think a lot of people are kind of attracted to that idea and it is a really empowering thing to do to like go to a march um, and see all the other people that are passionate about these issues and feel like inspired by them and hear the speakers because like when we did the march we went to Parliament Hill and then there was um, like over an hour of speakers, a lot of indigenous leaders, youth, um, high school activists. Um, so it was really kind of, it's really inspiring to hear like their perspectives and learn more about the issues while you're there. Feeling compelled to do her part in diverting waste from the landfill, Kathy Hammond now leads a zero waste life. In addition to carrying a water bottle, reusable cutlery, and cloth bags wherever she goes, she also eats vegetarian and shops for local and in-season groceries. But then I do all my bulk shopping at Herb and Spice on Bank Street just because it's closer for me and I can get um, like snack foods there and like flour and baking soda, things like, like the basics there. And with that, I bring my own mason jars and you just, they're very, they're very into that as well. They're not a zero waste grocery store like new, but um, they're very aware and they encourage people to bring them. So I just weigh them, do my thing, and then, yeah. Kathy is still on her journey to finding eco-friendly alternatives for items, but she says it's easier than it seems. Bypassing the aesthetic stigma and common misconception about the cost of these items is key to getting off on the right foot. What started off as a passion for the environment changed two years ago when she went on a service learning trip to Nicaragua and saw the lack of green infrastructure. And while I was there I um, just was like so shocked by the amount of um, litter and pollution they have there. And in rural Nicaragua, it's not really up to them. It's um, just the products they have available and they have to drink bottled water. So something that all I always thought about is that like, I live in a city where I have the option to not use these products, so I should be doing what I can. It's not that much more expensive, which I think is like a common misconception is because it, it tends to look expensive when you have like fancy glass jars and there's this like aesthetic that's associated with it. 
um, but I find it hasn't been that much more expensive. People feel this need to go out and buy a bunch of like um, bamboo cutlery and new mason jars and things like that when they want to switch. And I think that's actually more unsustainable. So I always tell people just use what you have and like take it slow kind of as you run out of things, figure out what you can swap it to instead of trying to do it overnight because it's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> I think it's really easy for a lot of people to take the attitude of like, oh, I'm just one person. Like, what am I going to do? And I think, and I, I find that too, like sometimes I'm, I'm like, well, why, like, why am I doing this? But you're not just doing it yourself, but like you're inspiring other people to do it and you're quite literally like leading by example. So I think it, it's like a ripple effect and hopefully it will catch on. Although some people say environmental activism is a lost cause, the sun hasn't set for these climate crusaders. For Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, a re-elected Liberal government means he will continue to promote his feminist brand. But how is this strategy helping women in business succeed? On the heels of the federal election, with the Liberal government maintaining their control in the House of Commons, how can Canada expect their highly publicized feminist agenda to continue helping Canadian women? In 2018, the Liberal government unveiled their Women Entrepreneurship Strategy, pledging $2 billion to double the amount of women-owned businesses by 2025. Key points of this strategy include a $20 million fund for female entrepreneurs, the strategy encompasses both financial assistance for women in business and capacity building initiatives. We sat down with three Ottawa women at different points in their entrepreneurial journeys to discuss the unique challenges and experiences of being a Canadian woman in business. Hi, I'm Taylor. I am the owner of Taylorland Collections, which is a sustainable business where I take clothes and give them a new life. So it started basically where I just emptied my closet and my friends' closets, basically, of clothes we didn't want and modeled them and started selling them. You have to do like a lot of marketing and finding how to style outfits together. And then you take the photos and then you post them online and hope that someone buys them. In addition to the federal government's commitment to helping women in business, there are 85 women's business networks and associations across Canada. The presidents of two Ottawa-based associations provide help to businesswomen like Taylor. The Women's Business Network is vital because women need a place to be in community and be supported. We have purposely created a safe space for women to come and learn from each other. So it's not about competition. In fact, our motto is no one cares what you know until they know that you care. And that's the absolute truth of it. Like I have had some criticism from people about my brand being too girly and like needing to have more of like a masculine touch to it because they just see a girl running it. Don't give up your unique, um, uh, you know, um, feminine energy. When I'm reselling things, price is always a very strong question for me of like, what is a price that will have someone appreciate the outfit, but at the same time isn't asking too much. Women in business, of course, struggle with knowing one's worth. Uh, for a long time, I think we've been in, um, we've been made to feel like we're meant to be at home. And so coming out of the home and offering something, we, we offer so much in the home and, we're, and there's no monetary exchange for that, right? And so coming outside of the home, we also were feeling like, well, how much do I charge for this? And so it, it comes with like a confidence. So confidence comes into play there. And then also um, uh, for some people, it's knowing who they are and why they're even selling what they're selling, right? So being passionate about what they're doing and then trusting that they have the experience, you know, not just the education, but the experience needed to charge a certain amount. Um, I enjoy being grassroots and doing it on my own. But I have acknowledged that I just don't have all of the skills to run a business all on my own. 
and to go and learn those skills from other women in kind of a similar situation for me, I think would be really beneficial and would be really fun. I think women's networks are still really important to give space for uh, women to start out. It's really important to kind of understand within yourself what you're ready for and what you want to do. Investments from the Liberal government, coupled with strong women-led community networks, provide women like Taylor the opportunity to see themselves anywhere. I see myself as an innovator, as a diplomat, as a lawyer. I see myself as an academic, as a social worker, as an analyst, a politician, as a well-rounded citizen of the world, as an engineer, as a social worker, as a successful black woman in power, as a lawyer. I see myself as a billionaire, as happy. Um, I see myself as a public relations manager. Um, and I see myself as an occupational therapist. As a counselor for maybe like troubled youth. We, we see ourselves as architects. I see myself running in the federal election and I see myself being Prime Minister of Canada. Last spring, basketball captivated a nation. The Toronto Raptors won their first NBA title. That's created a rebound in the sport's popularity as local leagues and courts are filled to capacity. Joe Malongo grew up in Ottawa. He's now a basketball player for the Canada Top Flight Academy, an elite basketball club in the city. Malongo has been playing the sport since he was little, but he didn't start out with it. Um, I used to be a soccer player as a young kid, and then I would always look to my left and I'd see these kids, these older kids playing basketball, and I seen how competitive it was. And uh, one day I decided to go to the park with my cousin and my brother. I uh, started playing basketball with them and then it started being something uh, I did every single day. started training with them and I just fell in love with the game ever since and then I never stopped playing. But Joe isn't alone. From Carleton University's successful basketball team to numerous basketball clubs in Ottawa seeing a rise in membership, many young people in the city are turning to basketball, putting the sport on the rise. A big reason why basketball is growing is its access. All you need is a ball and a hoop. And with sports like hockey pricing out even the middle class, basketball benefits. Taffy Charles is the coach of Carlton's men's basketball team. He says that where basketball stands out is its low cost compared to other sports. I do think that you know one of those sports like hockey is definitely one of those sports that you need to have means to do it. Um, you need to spend money all year round. And um, I just think with basketball, uh, you know, it doesn't cost you a whole bunch of money. It costs you, you know, as I said, shoes, you know, if you have shoes and if you actually have a basketball. And, um, you know, you don't need a whole bunch of people to do it. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with, you know, three on three now. You can do it, uh, you know, five on five, four on four. There's a number of different ways you can play basketball. So it's just easy to add people to it. It's easy to, you know, a ball doesn't cost a whole bunch of money. And, uh, again, you don't need anything other than a hoop and a ball. And because it's easily accessible, basketball also ends up being really inclusive and diverse. So much that just a few years ago, the Filipino Basketball Association of Ottawa changed their name. And recently, five years ago, just to be more inclusive, uh, we've even changed our name and to Ottawa Titans just so that people know that it's not just for Filipinos. And, and um, we, yeah, we've, we've been inclusive through there. Charles Go coaches one of the teams in the league. He says that one of the biggest motivating factors is the Raptors championship last spring. And that's especially felt in Ottawa. Um, and then now we, we have the Toronto Raptors. And I think them also having success, uh, recently winning an NBA championship. And even before that, with Vince Carter, you know, putting on a show, really inspired a lot of Canadians to take up basketball. And uh, in, especially in the nation's capital, you can see that where uh, Carleton University has, you know, wins almost every year. And it has really inspired. But basketball in Ottawa isn't perfect. The city is struggling to keep up to the sport's demand. 
just because I got lucky. <laughs> E.L. Adams II is from North Carolina. He came to play basketball in Nova Scotia for university and is now a registered psychologist in Ottawa. He said the city needs to up its game to make basketball more accessible. The scene here has been a bit limited to me just because at first I was met with so much uh, static, like to be able to do this and to want to volunteer here and to, to want to do this. Um, it's limited opportunities, I think, basketball-wise in Ottawa. There, you can't just go to any gym that has a basketball court because they're either doing volleyball in there, they're doing aerobics class, or they're doing yoga in there. Um, the city has so much hold on um, what's allowed in all these courts. I think the scene is is hurting, man, but it, it could be so much better because you have so many available uh, city resources and uh, gyms, but you, you don't have access to them at all. And uh, I worked in the school system, and um, a lot of the coaches can't have their gym after school time is over. The city takes it over, so it's, it's hard to, to build consistency, to provide a place for people to play constantly if you don't really have access to these places. But for Joe Malongo, it doesn't look like he's losing hope anytime soon. He says the city does need more gyms to make do for the rising basketball demand. But when it comes to rising stars, Ottawa's future is bright. We have a lot of talent. I just feel like uh, every single time we play a Toronto team, like we need to make a statement, you know, because uh, we have a lot of talent. I feel like uh, we could definitely compete with them. And like uh, I definitely think we're slept on, yeah. As Canada becomes more diverse, we might see more children in the city crossing over into basketball. Myrna Imara, 25th Hour, Ottawa. That's all for today, folks. Thank you for watching. I'm John Gallardo. And I'm Chelsea Robert. We look forward to seeing you at the end of November for our next edition of the 25th Hour.